Hello, thanks for checking out my Sleepy Time reading channel. Today we're going to do a chapter of How It Is Made by Archibald Williams, and this chapter is going to be on paper. This is chapter two, How Paper Is Made. The constituents of paper, wood pulp, a Kentish paper mill, preparing rags, boiling esparto grass, breaking the grass, beating and mixing, coloring, the paper-making machine, watermarking, drying, calendaring, a long roll of paper, rate of production, finishing art papers, drying, cutting, sorting, automatic stokers. Paper-making is one of the most interesting of all manufactures because, in the first place, its processes are so ingenious, and secondly, because some of the materials used are in appearance so utterly unlike the finished product. The main element of paper is the fibrous matter of certain vegetable substances, notably cotton, esparto grass, and wood. Most people have a dim idea that rags are used for paper, but comparatively few would suspect pine wood, and probably very few indeed have ever heard of esparto grass. Now, the quality of the paper depends very much upon the thing or things out of which the paper is manufactured. Drawing and other very high-class papers are made from rags. Some newspapers used to be printed on esparto paper. This is tough enough to enable you to wrap up a pair of boots tightly in it without splitting it. The paper of cheap newspapers once grew as pine trees in the forests of Canada or Scandinavia. Whether it be wood, grass, or rags, the substance contains a considerable portion of matter which must be removed, and the useful remainder then has to be minced up and pounded and bleached before it is fit for the paper-making machine. The first stage in the preparation of wood is done in the country where the timber grows. Logs are cut up into cubes of the size of lump sugar, which are crushed by powerful rollers and boiled by high-pressure steam for several hours in a solution of soda or sulfurous acid. The chemical dissolves the resinous, mineral, and other useless constituents, but only softens the tough vegetable fibers. The pulp is mashed and made into what looks like sheets of light brown cardboard, and is sent to the paper mill in that form. A mill which I visited in Kent handles all three kinds of materials in the manufacture of many varieties of paper. Let me now try to record what I saw there. In the first room, a number of women were hard at work sorting out linen and cotton rags, throwing them down on a metal slab to detect the presence of buttons, for buttons are as much out of place in paper as in a sausage. The sorted rags passed through a dusting machine, and were then cut up into small pieces, preparatory to undergoing much the same process as the wood cubes. We will not linger over this, but pass on to a large barn full of what appears to be trusses of hay but are really bundles of esparto grass, many thousands of them. The grass is imported from Spain and North Africa. The stalks, or rather leaves, are hard, polished, tough, and altogether most unsuggestive of paper. Close by the store stands a row of great boilers, each capable of holding about three tons of the grass. The esparto, after being dusted and sorted, is thrust in through a manhole at the top of the boiler, and the lid of the manhole is screwed down tight. Valves are open to admit steam and a solution of caustic soda, in which the grass stews for several hours. Then the lye is drawn off and the now quite soft fibrous matter is extracted and transported by a hydraulic lift to the potchers on the floor above. A potcher is a very large oval tub having a division running part way down the middle. At one side of the division is a casing in which revolves a drum with knives set round the outside. These moving knives almost touch some fixed knives attached to the bottom of the tub. In fact, the arrangement of the cutters is practically the same as that in a lawnmower. Into the potcher is put a quantity of soft esparto fiber and water. The drum is started and drives the mixture round and round, chopping the esparto into very small pieces till it looks like brown curds. At the end of two hours, the man in charge adds some chloride of lime to the vat, and in a very short time the mass turns a creamy white color. The bleaching agent is then washed out by copious streams of water, and the pulp is passed into a big tank called an agitating tank, on account of a big vertical paddle which revolves inside it to prevent the solid part of the pulp from settling at the bottom. 
From the tank, the pulp water is pumped up into the sand traps, a series of wooden troughs arranged like a maze, to catch any rubbish such as stalks or dust that may be present, and so arrives at the filters of the half-stuff machine, otherwise known as a press pate, paste press machine, which drains off most of the water and delivers the esparto pulp in thin blankets. These blankets are folded up and carried to the beater. The press pate is a very ingenious machine, but as it much resembles the wet end of a paper-making machine proper to be described presently, a full description of it need not be given here. Wood pulp sheets are disintegrated and bleached in just the same manner as the esparto, but afterwards the contents of the potcher are run into settling tanks for the water to drain away. The solid pulp is then dug out into trucks, which transfer it to the beater. There is no press pate process for the wood pulp. We may imagine that the rag, esparto, and wood pulps have now reached the beater stage. Whether they will be mixed together in the beater or not depends on what quality of paper is required. Sometimes rag and esparto pulps are blended, sometimes esparto and wood, sometimes all three, and again, sometimes each is used separately. But in any case, the pulp has certain ingredients added to it in the beater, which is a very close copy of the potcher in size and construction. These ingredients are china clay, size, and resin, and their office is to render paper non-absorbent and soft. The mixture is flogged by the beater for from eight to ten hours according to quality. It requires great skill and experience to tell when the process has been carried far enough and the excellence of the paper depends largely upon a thorough beating. Before the pulp is drawn off, a little coloring matter, blue, red, or pink, is added to counteract any undue tinge and produce a pure white. Here again, discretion must be exercised, for sometimes one thirty-second of an ounce of pigment suffices for 340 pounds of solid pulp, but yet that tiny quantity must not be omitted. The beating finished, the pulp descends to an agitating tank, from which it is pumped to the wet end of the paper-making machine. The chief feature of the wet end is an endless belt, five or six feet broad, of very fine brass wire gauze moving horizontally over a number of rollers. Along with it travels on each side a deckle strap of thick rubber. The pulp passes through a very narrow slit in a vertical barrier called the slice, regulating the thickness of the paper onto an apron, which guides it to the wire gauze belt. This is shaken vigorously from side to side by machinery to distribute the pulp evenly, and the deckle straps prevent any pulp from running off at the edges. The breadth of the paper, by the by, is decided by the distance between these straps. Almost in a moment, so much water drains through the wire that the pulp solidifies under our eyes. But gravitation alone would not extract the water efficiently. At the farther extremity of the wet end are two suction boxes underneath and touching the belt. The air is constantly sucked from these by pumps, and the fresh air rushing in to fill the vacuum is obliged to pass through the pulp and takes a large part of the remaining water with it. A roller, called the dandy roller, is situated above the belt between the suction boxes. It may be made of plain wire gauze, in which case all of the half-dried pulp that passes under it will be impressed merely with the pattern of the mesh and produce a wove paper, such as this book is printed on. Or it may have thick parallel wire ribs running round it at intervals and thinner wires set closer together running from end to end. The patterns in the paper make it laid. If the thinner wires run circumferentially like the ribs, you have a spiral laid paper. In addition, there may be an elaborate raised design or words made out of the wire, which make the watermark. The effect of the dandy is that some parts of the pulp get a harder squeeze than the rest. Wherever the wire touches the pulp, the pulp becomes thinner and more transparent, and so a pattern is produced, which you may see by holding the paper up to the light. The suction box is passed, the pulp encounters the felt-covered couch roller, which gives it a good ringing, and then two bright brass rollers in succession. After leaving the second of these, it is sufficiently consolidated to merit the name of paper, but its travels are as yet mostly before it, for it has to pass round the outside of 16 or more polished drums, 40 inches in diameter, 
heated internally by steam. These gradually rob it of its remaining moisture, and so prepare it for being pressed by several pairs of very hot rollers named calendars, which put a gloss on it. Finally, it is wound off at the dry end onto great reels holding from a half to two tons of paper. The longest continuous roll of paper ever made in this particular mill measured nine and three quarter miles and was exported to an exhibition in Australia. The speed at which paper is turned out by a machine depends largely upon the quality. For fine writing papers, it may be set down at from 60 to 90 feet per minute, but for newspapers, a rate of 400 feet is sometimes attained. The width may vary between 5 and 12 feet, and the thickness range from 1 to 11 units. Thus, the same machine can turn out paper varying from 11 pounds to 110 pounds to the ream. A ream is 480 sheets of demi size 17 and 3 quarters by 22 and a half inches. A large machine has an output of 70 tons a week when making inferior kinds of paper. Some papers go straight from the machine to the printer, but those of the art grade, which require a very fine finish, are taken to a special coating department. The paper is unwound from the reel through a trough filled with a white liquid mixture which two brushes moving vigorously to and fro distribute evenly over the surface as it emerges. A long arm thrust automatically under the paper gathers up a big loop, and as soon as the loop is complete, a rod catches the loop and the arm sinks to gather the next one. The rod is mechanically transferred with its load to a couple of endless chains running on raised tracks in the drying room. We see dozens of these festoons of snowy paper journeying slowly along to the end of this room, rounding the corner of the track and returning to a reeling machine which winds them off and sets the rods free for further duty. The paper is next passed once or twice, as the case may need, through a steam-heated calendar. The starching and ironing have made the surface smooth and glossy and capable of reproducing clearly the finest lines that may be printed upon it. The paper that was being coated at the time of my visit was destined for Country Life, a journal distinguished by the excellence of its illustrations. Sometimes, one may say generally, this class of paper is cut up into sheets at the mill by a rapidly revolving knife which flings sheet after sheet onto a table whence a boy gathers them into neat piles. However carefully the coloring and coating ingredients may be mixed, one batch of paper may differ slightly in tone from another. So before they go to the packer, the sheets are sorted according to tint by girls whose trained eyes detect the slightest color variation. The packing department contains a hydraulic press, which squeezes a bale very tightly, while men encircle it with strip iron. Other interesting machines on the premises are the huge steam engines of from 300 to 500 horsepower, which make the wheels of the factory go round and the automatic stokers, which feed coal from hoppers into the glowing furnaces of the boiler house. The man in charge has only to fill up the hoppers now and then, instead of being constantly obliged to open the furnace door and face the scorching heat while shoveling in more fuel. And that's the end of Chapter 2 of How It's Made. Thanks again for checking out my channel. Feel free to like, subscribe, leave any comments. And I'll be back soon with more How It's Made. Thanks.